Welcome to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast, where we hear the stories of information security professionals. This podcast explores different angles, out-of-the-box ideas, and the human element of cybersecurity. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash CSCP so we can continue to bring on amazing guests. You can watch videos of the interviews at www.cybercloudpodcast.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. Today, we have the absolute pleasure to have Philip Wall uh, online with us. So we have him here. So I welcome everybody back. This is your host, Francesco Cipollone. Um, we'd like to welcome Philip Wall. Philip, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell the audience a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, what keeps you busy this day? Sure. Thanks for the warm, warm welcome, Francesco. I'm Philip Wiley. I live in the Dallas, Texas area. My day job is pen testing. I'm a red team lead for a global consumer products company. Been pen testing for a little over eight years. So offensive security has been my sweet spot, the area of security that I enjoy the most. I'm also an adjunct professor at Richland College. I teach ethical hacking and web app pen testing. And I'm also the founder of the Pwn School Project, which is a monthly meetup where we teach different cybersecurity related skills. When we started out, it was mainly towards offensive security and testing and that related uh, topics. But then we kind of expanded it to more security in general. So it's not all just offensive. And I also was in the uh, Tribe of Hackers Red Team book that came out last year. So no, amazing. And thank you for the the contributions to the community. As, as always, I'm, I'm massively involved, but I, I love people that, that get involved in the community and do it for no reason, specifically to it's just pleasure. grow other people and other culture. And, and we do this to actually distribute as much as much knowledge as possible. And you are actually the first one who started the segment about, you know, red teaming, pen testing, you know, that stream. So welcome and thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's gonna be great. So I know I know you're collaborating with ITSP. So do you want to talk a little bit about the podcast and how it started, uh, the Uncommon yes. Journey? Yeah, actually, that the Uncommon Journey is a podcast that's host, hosted on ITSP Magazine by Alyssa Miller, Chloe Mistagi, and myself. And we just it kind of the idea started up over like a little conversation, direct message conversation on Twitter about starting a podcast. So. We started that and I really like ITSP Magazine because they're really big on community and I like their attitude towards diversity and inclusion. Their message is a good one. So it was a good a good platform for us to, to partner with. Uh, I love uh, I love Mark and I love Sean. And, and as you know, we're collaborating, we tease each other constantly. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I'm in LA, we just uh, teasing each other. But no, it's, it's a great community. I, I try to give up as much space as possible, but they are very prolific. I mean, right now, it's just I have a long list of podcasts to listen to. <laughs> Sometimes, like, I can't just spend all day listening to podcasts. <laughs> and I feel bad because some, sometimes I just can't listen to podcasts of my friend and I can't catch up with them. For me, it's yeah. like connecting with people, you know, off stream. So, yeah, I, I need to, I promise that I'm going to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot, lots to choose from. And, and one of the things I like when I, one of my favorite times to listen to podcasts, it used to be, you know, on commutes into the office, but now it's been since the social isolation, I go on Very daily walks. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes <laughs> when I walk, I go out and I listen to a podcast while I'm out walking. So actually, I want to pick that because we've been talking that uh, in, 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 the, in the recent podcast that we're doing. How do you cope with, uh, especially in the pen testing in, in the red teaming area, how do you cope with this isolation and the... Uh, not the isolation as such, but the fact that you don't have time anymore or you don't have that stru- strict division between home time and personal time. How do you how did you cope with that? And what kind of suggestion can you do to um, want to be a cat or want to be yeah. pen tester and ongoing pen tester, right? Demos or such. I spent 
most of my career working with a remote office. The, my previous job, I worked for almost three years, 100% remote. So I was kind of used to it. But one of the biggest tips I would tell anyone, and this is helpful for no matter what area you work in, red team, pen testing, any type of security, really any job in general, if you have a workspace and a computer, is to separate your workspace. So that way, you know, at the end of the night, you can go to your living room or den or whatever and and separate, you know, life from your 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 work. And that's good. And that one of the reasons I did that too was studying because uh for the longest time when I was working remote, my office was my my uh living room. I would sit on the couch <laughs> and work on my couch. And then when it came to studying, it was hard to really concentrate. And then there was no delineation between work and non-work so that's why i created set up a i did have a desk it was kind of an older desk it really didn't accommodate bigger monitors and work that well so i redid my office space so i got a dedicated office space so i can study and do podcasts and and teach remote and all this stuff so you have to separate it out and that is just good in general even if you're studying if you have two different spaces you start to get bored or tired, you can move to another location in your house. So usually on the weekends, even if I'm studying, I try to study in my living room to try to break it up from the mm-hmm. from my day job. I'm trying to create that space and that division. Yeah. I think that's great for people that has that chance. But I was chatting, for example, with Tanya, and uh, we just say, you know what, even a curtain uh, is, is easy to do when we have green screen. And I have a curtain myself because I don't have a massive space, unfortunately. Uh, price of houses in London are just slightly different than Texas. <laughs> just a tiny bit. I like that. Yeah. And space is like, it's vertical, it's not horizontal. <laughs> so you don't have that much space. But yeah, no, I, I think is specifically in this time, it's important to have a break because it kind of feels blurred sometimes to me. It's like sleep, eat, work sleep, eat, work, and, and sometimes you just lose consciousness of which day it is and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, I think from, from a mental perspective, it's, it's good to, to go out on a walk, as you said, um, to give that space and that division. Yeah, I agree. But, but we do with the Cloud Security Alliance, we started some uh, outreach with uh, the university and uh, working with students. But I know, I know you, you teach and, and work with students, so tell me more about that. What is the what is the project that you started? Yeah, um, I teach at a, at a community college here in Dallas, and that's actually what inspired me to start the Pwn School project. And the Pwn School project's educational meetup. We're really fortunate in the Dallas Fort Worth area to have so many different uh, organizations to choose from. Because I don't know if you you've heard of Dallas Hackers Association. No, uh, I'm actually a bit disconnected from the. Yeah. From the I'm, I'm, I'm more, I'm more towards the California coast. Uh, okay. but yeah, no. Tell me, tell me everything about. Uh, yeah, we've got a really good, really good scene here. We've got Dallas Hackers Association, and we have a local OWASP chapter. We've got a local DEF CON group. We've got several ISSA chapters in the area. Amazing. And uh, from my teaching, I decided to start the Pwn School project because I had students in my class at the time I was just teaching the one class, ethical hacking. And my students that first semester said, where do we go next to learn? Because not everyone has the money to pay for SANS training. And <laughs> and so I thought, you know, maybe I could get together with some students on the weekend and just kind of show them some some different things. And and the more I thought about it, I had a couple students that tried to sign up for my summer class. They couldn't transfer to get into my class. And and I kind of decided I needed to, I wanted to start something that it didn't cost anyone to, to learn. Anyone can mm. show up and learn. So I started the Pwn School Project. And I host two different meetings. One is in Dallas, Texas, and one is in Denton, Texas. And Denton is my hometown. That's where I grew up. So it was kind of, I have some friends there and it was kind of a, had, held a special place in my heart. They didn't have a security community or kind of any kind of technology community. So I have two meetings a month, one there and one here. But with the uh, social isolation from COVID, we've had to go remote. And fortunately, last spring, spring of 2019, I started streaming my meetup. So that way people outside of the area could benefit from the talks. And we've had people, we've had Tim Medine on there, wow. uh, safety instructor, Red Siege uh, pen tester, you know, for that company, as well as uh, Ben 10 from Trusted Sec. He did a workshop for us in Denton. 
And so it was really interesting when I started the Pwn School Project, I was okay with teaching every session. But what happened as soon as people saw it announced, I, already, I had people offering to present. So oh, that's there was great. from the community, people wanted to help out and that was great. And there's only been a couple occasions that I've presented or taught. I usually keep it open because, you know, you can't have the same thing over and over again, the different viewpoints, yeah. even though you discuss web app pen testing three times in a year, everyone's going to have a different view. So it's been <laughs> pretty good. And, and uh, we shouldn't talk about top 10 over and over again, please. Yeah. <laughs> Move on to SBS, please, or something like that. <laughs> As, as Jim says, like, let's move on from top 10, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's other standards that people don't think about that are kind of forgotten, like the WASC, the Web Application Security Consortium. Uh, that that, that has stumbled across. Yeah, that one you don't hear much about. Whenever I was got first exposed to application security, when we were doing our uh, web application vulnerability scans, I found out about WASC the same time I found out about OWASP. And you just, really? I guess, OWASP has become more popular and it gets more attention, but you know, there's more than one, one standard. It's kind of, it's good to look at more than one standard just to kind of, you know. No, I do that. For example, we were, uh, I was building uh, like a maturity model for, for a DevSecOps initiative and uh, I built one that is much wider and, and I'm wondering if it could be an evolution of OWASP. But uh, I started looking at different standards and BSIM and, and some are nicely paired up together by the two different standards, but I didn't know uh, the WASP project, that yeah. the WASP, <laughs> other than the OWASP project, yeah, uh, the top 10. Now that's yeah. great. That's what we do this thing. <laughs> yeah. Share the knowledge. Um, yeah, that's the nice thing about being plugged into the community. You learn so much from different people. I mean, for me, one of the areas <laughs> I need to learn more about is cloud, but to LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, I, I found people that I can connect to that if I need to, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 the cloud. Yeah. So yeah, I've got, I've got resources to, that I can talk to to learn about cloud. Find you know. Good yeah, resources. just poke us. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to do actually as much knowledge as possible, but right now what we're finding is there is a massive gap in just basic understanding of how to secure the cloud and how to evaluate to demystify the cloud. So we're doing a lot of podcasts on the really basic stuff. And then we're going to start some verticals. So we had some really good talk, for example, last year at our conference about Lambda security and automatic triggering of uh, lockings and, and, others, and other events. But I think if we go back to COVID stuff, I think this gives us a great opportunity to actually start streaming and start expanding those communities. And I found, so last year we did the, our, our own conference with the Cloud Security Alliance and I wanted a uh, few people to come in. And of course, I didn't have the sponsor to pay for the flight and everything else. So we had to reduce the size of, of our people. But this year we have no limitation. We can go <laughs> wild. And, but that can also result in, as you were saying, uh, you're into to podcast today. Uh, you're going to have a lot, a lot of conference going on. So it could be over information. So how do you, how do you cope and choose with all these goodies? It's like juice show. Yeah, it's, uh, I, yeah, I need to, at times I probably need to be better about, and it hasn't really, even though there's been a lot more virtual conferences going on, I've probably done more virtually this year than I did in person last year, but it's kind of, I kind of take it as it comes. If there's a lot going on this week, then next week there may not be. So mm -hmm. it hasn't been too bad. There's been a couple of conferences that I presented at the same day, but fortunately it was spread out enough. But the thing I really do love about these virtual conferences is a way to share with people that normally are able to get access to that content. Yeah, no, I love that. And especially the, the, the offline part when the, the video is recorded or everything else is distributed, it gets, uh, everybody can actually access and see. Uh, I couldn't go to, for example, reInvent in Boston, um, uh, Reinfor Reinforce actually in Boston for the AWS security. And uh, I, was, I was watching some of the presentation and they're amazing. And yeah, power of YouTube. So yeah. how did you how did you start in in pen testing? What triggered you on what sparked your interest on on that part, or how did you start? Actually, from the beginning of my technology career, I started out as a sysadmin, and I do a talk on becoming a pen tester called the Pen Tester Blueprint. And one of the things I always share is, you know, some people start, you know, someone may have worked in IT, they may have been a developer, 
and they've done this for several years and they think I'm starting from scratch, know that even if you're going into security and not necessarily offensive security, that experience you have counts for something because it's like going to college. You've got to take your different classes, you know, for that degree. And it's the same thing with offensive security. So I like to share that detailed path. So I started out as a sysadmin, did that for a little over six years. Then I moved into the network security team and mm-hmm. we all did the same thing at that time. There's like four of us on the team. Everyone did firewalls, intrusion detection, oh, and some assessment. Yeah. <laughs> the IPS team. <laughs> yeah. This is like when IPS was just coming out. This is still intrusion detection. Which, so which IPS we did, were you playing with? Uh, we were using one that was, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It was by, uh, it was bought out by IBM. I'm trying to think. It, it, it escapes well, me now. That's the, that, that's one I remember playing with a little bit in fine tuning was Tipping Point, that then yeah. got bought by HP, and that's back in the day. So or when uh, or when Power was actually a thing. Yeah, <laughs> you did Power then go across all checkpoint checkpoint Power with a central central console yeah. to push policies and stuff like that back in the day. All the picks. <laughs> yeah, so I did some picks because we had PIX firewall. We had a CyberGuard firewall, which we were migrating from PIX firewalls. And CyberGuard, I think they're still around, but they would you would either get an appliance or build a server. So we built like is before HP acquired Compact. So we had a couple of uh, a uh, a couple of uh, Compact servers that were clustered together, and it was running the. Uh, CyberGuard firewall, and it used like a hardened version of SCO Unix. And it was pretty interesting because to control the network lever, uh, level, then you had the network layer, you had to use certain credentials to control the system, use different credentials. It's a very hardened system, and they were using it a lot in the government back then. The, the I think security... I stumbled across something similar in, in one of the appliances when you had different, different, yeah. different kind of uh, segment or environmental zones where you had to access with different credentials. It's like so, similar to SC Linux, but more more containerized. Yeah. So that that was what we went to. And then uh, I did network security for a little over a year. And we had a, a CISO, the company hired a CISO. And when he came in, he was a little more in touch with what you know modern security teams look like. So he mm-hmm. kind of split this out to different teams. And fortunately, I got to put on application security. So through application security, <laughs> I got to do, you know, web vulnerability scans with app scan. So that was my exposure to pen testing and application security, which was, you know, a big moment in my career because I found out about pen testing. And so I was, I did that from about 2005 to 2012 when I got laid off from the mortgage company I worked for. And it was my dream to become a pen tester. And I went to work as a pen tester for a consulting company. Uh, during the call, I, I'd stressed how I had a home lab, how I did a lot of learning on the side, and the technology was my hobby, not just my job. And and the guy saw my passion and gave me a chance. And so that's how I got into pen testing. We've been in offensive security for a little over eight years now, and I love it. No, I, I never, I never crossed the path to offensive. I've always been on, on the blue side, and hence why yeah. the the blue, <laughs> the blue background, I think, is is kind of automatic. But right now, the areas are being blurred. I mean, if you look at the FSecOps and the continuous testing, effectively, you are stress testing your own application, and you can continuous compliance and continuous testing. You you're almost wearing uh, double hats, so red yeah. and red and blue becoming purple, where you can actually test your application. Uh, a little bit more, so the line are getting blurred. So there isn't more anymore a definition of offensive and defensive. So yeah. How do you see the world evolving from here? It's just gonna it's gonna be like anything else. When you, your smaller companies, you know, the DevSecOps is kind of an exception to the rule, but you know, have a lot of companies that are you know smaller. They've got someone doing their servers and their Cisco routers and switches. So depending on the size of the company, bigger companies, they can afford to silo it and get people that are more specialized. But yeah, I can see that, you know, and the purple team thing, I think that's really big because one of the things we're kind of looking at at our company is uh, doing more purple team stuff. And I think that's good. You know, you just don't want to do your red team exercises, your pen tests and not really work hard securing it. Because the main thing at the end of the day is making sure your environment is secure. So yeah. working with the blue team while you're doing your red team engagements to say, did you detect this? Go back and they didn't detect it. Then 
work on tuning your your IPS and your endpoint solutions to detect those patterns. Hey, Francesco here. A very quick message from our sponsor and then we return back. This podcast is brought to you by the generosity of NSC42 Limited, your cybersecurity partner. Cybersecurity is complex and different for every organization, and you need the best tailored service to make sure your customer's data is safe and sound so you can focus on what's important, focusing on your clients and bringing the best and safest experience. NSC42 Limited can help you during your cloud transformation, cybersecurity assessment for your compliance checklist on premise and on the cloud. Want to know more? Visit www.nsc42.co.uk to get your free quote. You know, I think it's it's a nice and natural evolution because then you just uh, you ended up just with either empty report and nobody action on in, in something that is step by step more actionable on the fly. And I've seen reports of pen testing. Or pen tests are sitting there, and pen tests for the sake of pen testing or regulation are even worse. <laughs> and one of the things I want to stress too is, is blue team is very important. To, red teaming sounds so sexy to people, and that's what they want to do because it seems like some spy stuff. But I think a lot of times when people really realize what happens in pen tests, you know, you've got to write a report, you have to deal with scheduling with IT, and then sometimes you you write a report, people don't agree with your finding, and you feel like a lawyer trying to defend a client. That's the so, mistake by Red Team. <laughs> yeah, and if you, if you break something, something goes down, then you get in a lot of trouble. So it's not all fun and games. But at the same time, the Blue Team stuff can be, can be fun. I enjoyed it when I was doing it. And all the different things you have out there. I mean, if I went back and I don't know, I... I love offensive security and AppSec, but if I had to choose something else like threat hunting or threat intel would be interesting, but there's so much out there and it's needed. So, I mean, I really advise anyone to really get out there and explore mm. what's out there. Don't just skip to red team. I mean, ever, I mean, it's amazing how many people you see, they want to be an ethical hacker. They want to go right to red team, but that other stuff's important. You know, and, and, and if, if you learn to, how to defend and if you yeah. learn how to build, then you defend how to attack and you can switch between sides exactly. because it's fun and it keeps a thing fresh. So if you just learn how to smash stuff, then exactly. you don't know how to avoid detection. If you know how to, how somebody detects your stuff, then you, you become a better pen test because you had the trace much better. Exactly. The, so I think the best, pen testers, the best pen testers know how to defend. And you hear a lot of these guys that are, that you see at these big conferences, they talk about going back and forth is how, how they got to be good. So yeah, you definitely, and you need to understand, you need to know the technology too. Even looking at the security piece, you've got to really understand technology. You know, mm -hmm. if you're administering a firewall, you really need to understand routing and you need to understand networking. So you need to understand the technology and the security, you know. You, but even you pen testing, I mean, a lot of people just jump in, okay, I just do web stuff. And then, okay, what about the reconnaissance? What about the IP addressing? What about if, uh, how to hide your DNS or how to hijack DNS? The more tool you know, the, the, the more way to lateral things you can come up. And you really yeah. need to be aware on the person. So I say, well, you start with a basic network. It's like with everything else, network, and then you layer on. Yeah. Like operating system and then application and application security. And then you go and in the stratosphere and that data security database is security just doing things right. Or if you want red teaming, it's breaking things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it works it right. Just, it gives you something to fall back on. If you're wanting to be a consultant, then if you know some network security or you know some different blue team, uh, concepts, then it's going to be easier for you to stay busy, you know, because a lot of consulting jobs, your your bonuses are based on billable hours. So the more mm -hmm. things you know, the better you are. And then if you ever aspire to be a security architect, you know, if you have more real well-rounded experience, then you're going to be more cut out for that type of role. I agree. So how do you see how do you see the role of a security architect going since we touch on it in in the modern world? Because I see the uh, I've been I've been security architect for a very long time before and consulting in that space, mm -hmm. but um, I see the role kind of challenged and kind of shifting into more a, a, a hybrid with the DevSecOps into these modern days. How do you see that in in your role and in your in your experience? 
Yeah, I kind of see the DevSecOps becoming more more uh, valuable and then also like cloud because a lot of companies, if they're not going 100% cloud, they're at least taking their Office 365 to the cloud, you know, which makes sense. You're Azure and you're, you're hosted Active Directory for, for that environment. So yeah, I really see that people that are doing architecture definitely need a good understanding of, of cloud and DevSecOps can help because the biggest weakness I've seen a lot of times with architects is they traditionally come more from from what I've experienced from an infrastructure, network infrastructure background. Yeah. They really understand that space, but they don't really understand the cloud side of things. And I think it is hard because traditionally you have two streams where you have a developer that then becomes DevOps nowadays, and eventually DevSecOps, well, an architect is, as you say, traditional infrastructure network operating system, mm -hmm. and then eventually becomes aware of certain bits uh, from a WAF perspective. But that's the majority of people that have interacted. But really, dipping the toe in application security makes you so much well-rounded. Yeah. I had, I had, and it's hard because you have to, to, to go back to coding like crazy. Uh, I had, uh, I did uh, an application security program of recent and I had to just uh, crush my skills back of coding on, on some bloody language. <laughs> <laughs> and your head hurts, but it, it's hard yeah. because you get different perspective and you say your track modeling becomes better. Mm -hmm. I really so think, I really think architecture teams need to be more than one person, definitely, because you know, even if you got someone that knows the application side, the infrastructure side, you still really need, I think, a, a team, you know, more than one person to do that. Of course, some yeah. companies are only going to have one, but I think really you need a team. No, I think, and, and it's a different vision. So uh, an enterprise architect has that uh, logical view that normally if you are in a, in a development team day to day, you don't have that long term view. And also you don't want to communicate with the business over and over and over. You want somebody else that translate what the business want into logical terms. So I, I really think architecture is, is the buffer between the business and the various technical team and the one that string everything together to avoid, for example, a house to get built completely sideways and maintain yeah. the structural entity of, um, of an organization. It's like, and, and take hard decision, hard stance decision of we're going to move that entity in a, in a separate world because it's better to merge up different things. And that's long-term strategic view that uh, you can't kind of evaluate day by day. What's your view on it? Do you agree, disagree? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I think it's something you, you just have to constantly evaluate how, you know, how things are going and and I really think too is even from a, a offensive perspective, really bringing in that role too. Uh, you know, one of the things is a really good resource for someone on the blue team. If you're not really wanting to get that deep in defensive security, is the MITRE attack framework. Just understanding those attacks. Yeah. So I think that's one of the big things missing. A lot of cases is I think a lot of companies aren't really bringing the offensive team in enough on, even from an architectural perspective. You know, testing out. You know, help. Maybe you know even pen testing some of the devices or look, reviewing some of the reports that have been uh, done, the security assessments done on certain devices and stuff. Uh, I, have, I have a bit of a feeling that we, we're getting overwhelmed with framework because we had the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, you have the whole stream of cloud security stuff, then you had the MITRE attack that now is, is, is evolving. Uh, before that, I think we had uh, the attack hill chain that uh, yeah. effectively could be mapped. I think we're just starting off framework, so it's getting it's getting harder and harder to get to get the truth one <laughs> to start. Yeah, it is. I, I'm, I'm struggling myself sometimes. It's like which one should I choose? Effectively, uh, I, I like matter attack, and and I think it's it's getting there. Um, but since you've been in application security for a little while, what do you think about the CWE and and all the and all the complexity behind the the whole extended format? From, the CV instead of CWE and yeah. uh, how to evaluate application security versus traditional infrastructure security vulnerability. Yeah, it's kind of tough. I think, you, but you kind of want, you know, for your internal program, I think you, you take a hybrid approach because, and, you know, you can, you know, reference more than one framework or more than one standard too. Because just like a lot of the, my experiences, the, the CVV, or the CVE uh, ranking system because they have a really good ranking system on on rating your risks and stuff yeah. too. So you kind of have to take a hybrid approach and 
And, you know, even what we've had some third party pen tests done on our web applications and they, you know, refer stuff outside of it. They refer the, the CVE uh, standard as far as the risks, risk rating and stuff too. I think it's a really, one of the pieces I think gets overlooked a lot of times is rating the risks of the findings. Sometimes mm. you see that this is, you know, cross-site scripting. They're not taking in consideration the risk of what this is. Is this just a brochure site? If it's a brochure site, you can't get to, you can't do much harm there. Then you kind of need to adjust your risks based on that. Is there any mitigating controls and, you know, testing your stuff whitelisted and non-whitelisted to see what can happen with the controls there and without the controls. A lot but of mistakes. But that's the kind of perception that an internal team, that's why I said proto team, I, <laughs> I like the idea because then you, 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 you kind of unify the internal knowledge of an application and the business knowledge of the company that says this website, you can't get anywhere, but maybe you can do lateral movement from that website. Uh, I was discussing with uh, Andrew Peterson on the Etsy and they said, well, when we start monitoring, for example, the attack pad, the attack weren't coming, for example, from the from the front or from the PCI space, but we're coming from uh, side website. So visibility is one thing to, to reduce, but also business intelligence is a great way to understand the, the impact of effectively vulnerability getting exploited. And just breaking a website doesn't mean that you're in or that you can cause damage. Yeah, definitely. That has to be taken in consideration. I, and it's amazing sometimes how uh, lax people can be on that. When I was <laughs> consulting there for a while, one year of my consulting career, all I did was application pen test. And one of my favorite all-time hacks, I was doing a uh, web application pen test for this external internet-facing application. And through SQL injection, I was able to get command line access to that system. It was a development system so they ended up filing an exception externally because it was not production. But yet, you know, it's on the production network. <laughs> you can pivot, you know, make a lateral movement to another Hello, system. Hello, lateral movement. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and since it's web app pen test, then I couldn't really leave that server. That was the that was the stopping point of the scope, which if it would have been included network pen test, who knows what else could have been done. But just the fact that someone can get from the outside in. <laughs> because we all, we all know that when, when an attacker wants to attack you, he has a limited scope. So he said, it, it yeah. reached, it reached oh, it's a development server. Sorry, sorry, I need to back oh, yeah, I can't do anything. <laughs> it's development, so I can't get to any production credit card information. So I'll just go ahead and go on to the next person. <laughs> That's how it works, right? <laughs> 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 oh god yeah, yeah no but actually since you touched that point uh what are, what are your yeah uh, tell me some more stories about funny or non funny stories about hack during your consulting days or things that you can disclose of course yeah, which one was the funniest one or the best bad days some of the inter well some of the, the bad days is one one company i was i had like a big number of ip addresses to to run port scans again because it was PCI, mm. the PCI pen test. And so Nmap just wasn't going fast enough. And I just read about MassScan and the uh, hackers, the uh, hacker playbook. And so I went through the hacker's playbook and saw about MassScan. It's supposed to be able to scan the whole internet in five minutes. <laughs> so I used it on this on this firewall and it, just, <laughs> and scans and it died. So I thought maybe if I bump it up to 10,000 packets per second or whatever, <laughs> the the setting was maybe to, and there was a couple of legacy firewalls that got rebooted. That. <laughs> yeah, so I ended up having the, one of their guys on site. Uh, we had a call, and so they wanted him watching over my shoulder the rest of the pen test in case something happened. And I was really, I was really dreading that, but it's kind of funny. I made a friend. The guy and I we we're still friends, and we still text each other from time to time on Signal and message each other, but. That's you know, great from the story from the <laughs> trenches. <laughs> he was interested in pen testing, so we had a lot to talk about. So not ended up not being that bad. So that anytime you crashed a system, that was always the worst. Or, you know, just the finding sometimes because you know, this is someone's and it's like their child. You know, you tell someone their child's ugly. So, you know, some you find someone in their network or their application that's insecure, you know, somebody can get blamed. So they're trying to defend it. Either they don't want to look bad or either they think. And it's understandable. I've been a sysadmin before. 
I've applied all my patches, did all the hardening. This can't be possible. So that can be kind of a challenge to mm. defend your pen test without being too passionate. You have to kind of, you know, make sure that you do it in a very professional manner and make sure you don't upset them. But, but yeah, the consulting was interesting. One of the things I liked about it was the the different environments. It wasn't the same thing each pen test. It would change up across different industries. And like my second consulting job was was one of the best because if I wanted, if I had, you know, when I went there, I hadn't done any wireless pen testing. So, you know, anything you want to do, you can read up on it, take a course study, and they would let you, you know, shadow someone, and then you'd start getting to do those type of tests. So I got to do a a secure SDLC review for for some apps while I was there. So it was a really good experience. And anyone that's getting into security or any other area, if you have the opportunity to work in consulting. I would do it for at least a, a period of time because you pick up so much so quickly. Because mm-hmm. if you're in the same Probably environment, fine. yeah, even a lot of environments may be .NET, but they may have some JSP stuff going there too. But when you're you're a consultant, you're exposed to so many different things. So you recommend yeah. everybody. So going back to the point of how do you start, for example, in pen testing, do you, do you suggest, for example, starting a career in uh, uh, in consulting or giving a little bit of time before consulting? I got my start in pen testing as a consultant. You know, there's pros and cons to it. If you have an organization that's really patient and will work with people to bring them up to speed, consulting is a good way to go. If if they're not, then you may want to go more the route of being an internal resource. But the only thing that happens there is if you're doing network pen tests for PCI, you can get bored after a while. So the variety is kind of nice. But I, I almost I think if you really want to be the best you can. I would start out with consulting if you can, but ultimately it's however you get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as well as I do any area of security, sometimes it's hard to just get started. So just get yeah. in, getting and in And the entry point, we, we keep on discussing this with a few, having a few people and we were discussing today with a bunch of recruiters. Uh, but effectively, we, we should get away from, from asking a super high requirement to, to get in the door because it, it blocks junior people from getting in. We should push for mentorship. We should push for more things similar to that because people grow, and there is so many resources available. But you know, are you, when you get out of university, it's I think it's rare that you off the shelf pen tester or red teamer. You, you need to get into that. So, what kind of suggestion, for example, would you give in getting involved in the community, building your own project? How do people show, for example, on the first job that they're really committed and passionate about, as you, as you, as you say? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the biggest things, you know, anytime I'm interviewing a pen tester and I hear they have a home lab, that's a big plus that they're involved in the community. Yeah, you have to get involved in the community because what happens there is if you're a member of some of the local meetups, your local DEF CON groups, your OWASP groups, when you meet people in those organizations, they may not be the hiring manager, but they know who the hiring manager mm. is. And if they have openings, they can get the resume directly to the hiring manager because, you know, HR gets, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of resumes they have to sort through. Sometimes they don't always pick the best choice and it's hard to really display your your personality and passion through a resume sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah really get out there and network, you know, go to different meetups, uh, you know, InfoSec, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn, just really network. You have to constantly be networking. And once you get that network built up, my past three jobs, not including my teaching job, were from referrals. My mm-hmm. my current job, uh, someone I knew from Dallas Hackers Association happened to take my ethical hacking class spring of last year. And he'd already knew me from the community, but he was trying to recruit me to where I'm at now. And that's how I got the job. I wasn't even looking for a job. <laughs> offered. So the networking helps. I mean, I've, I refer people, my students, when people are looking for entry-level pen testers. I knew a recent university grad that wanted to get into pen testing. And I, rem- I knew because I saw him at Dallas Hackers all the time. I saw him at the local OWASP chapter. I've known him for a few years. I knew he was very professional, knew his technical skills. So when someone was looking for pen testers, I referred him. So just getting in there in the community, referring, you know, those referrals, working on projects like you, like you mentioned, you know, a lot, even like in map, like during the summer, they do like Google do like their summer code where they hire true. people to come. They work true. on projects. 
politics. And so building tools like that, if you really, if you're interested in ever speaking at these big conferences, you see a bulk of these talks are people that wrote tools. Yeah. Well, so that's, I, actually, I have, I have a challenge with that because some of the conference, especially in the US, is very tool specific. Or very, uh, if you have a CV, you can get away with it. But actually, yeah. cyber, it, it, it's more than that. But because US is very engineering post, and it's very, very different from uh, UK and the rest of uh, Europe, where, where it's more GLC, risk and control, you know, it's more generic talks. Yeah. Um, I think we, we should find a new balance. <laughs> I agree. There's a lot of times methodology and stuff. I mean, one of the talks that I give at conferences a lot is on becoming a pen tester. And sometimes it gets turned out. There's a lot of good, you know, uh, talks submitted. But sometimes I think we overlook the stuff that's helps people get into the field. The majority of people, yeah. And then no. and even my talk, it's not really a beginner talk because people are going to pen testing typically aren't someone that's this is their first job technology. They've... They've worked somewhere. They may have worked help desk, my business admin, might have been a developer or something. And so it's not really an entry level position. But yeah, you need no, a good I, mixture of that. I, I completely agree. And and it could open some of these conferences to new and fresh blood because otherwise, if you always do the cutting edge stuff, I mean I agree on the cutting edge stuff because yeah. that's that's how we push each other to, to learn more in the latest tool or the latest uh, you know, hack and stuff like that. But also we can open the, the networks to new people that want to get into the field or they want to learn the basic. Um, yeah. Most of my, I, I do a lot of uh, basic cloud security stuff or I do application security 101 because a lot of people don't know how to do consistent SDLC and Tanya does the same and Jim <laughs> kept on hammering on the top there. So I think those are great because it brings new, fresh, new blood and new developer I think, into the space. But tell me, yeah. tell me a little bit about how did you ended up ultimately in the travel podcast? What's that? In the, in the book. Oh yeah, the uh, actually I was referred from uh, the guy that runs Dallas Hackers Association. When they were writing the books, they would reach out to different people that they knew in the community that were going to be in the books or been in previous books. They would reach out to them and ask them about people and. Uh, Wirefall from Dallas Hackers Association, the founder, he, he recommended me to the book. And one of the things I like about the book is they really look for people that are community focused. Mm. So, I mean, there's a lot of people in there, you know, Jason Street, uh, there's been at least two, two of the three books. I'm not, not sure if he's in the third book or not, but there's people who have been in, in several of the books. But one of the things that's really nice is people that care about the community because those books are really geared towards people that are interested, like, you know, the tribe of hackers. They ask people questions about, you know, their experiences as a red teamer. And so this is really good for people starting out. They can get, you know, like in the tribe of hackers, red team, there's 47 different people they interviewed for that book. So you get 47. Golden nuggets. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I need to go through it. So if, if I only had three life in parallel, <laughs> to go through all this content. <laughs> it's challenging. But then, uh, other than the community, how do you learn and how do you grow? How do you learn new stuff? What kind of suggestion would you give to people to learn yeah. that thing? Twitter is, is go, I keep going back to that. I'll keep going back to that resource because you're in touch with people that are, you know, writing the tools, coming with the techniques and presenting on different topics. And the thing I like about Twitter compared to some other social media platforms. <laughs> is you don't have to follow people to see their content. Someone can retweet it. You, you know, it's not like Facebook or something where you have to be connected to see someone's content or you, things just don't come up on your timeline. You could select different types of uh, content to follow and it'll come up. So it's a really good place to connect. And there's a lot of conferences that have accounts on there. So, uh, you know, you get to find about the different tools and techniques. So it's a really good resource and people will put their blog posts and articles and books and stuff they're coming out with. So that's one of the areas I look first. When I was getting started out in security, I would use blogs and then our RSS feeds to look at the different blogs, you know, the blog aggregators. And then just, you know, now it's like Twitter or LinkedIn are really good resources. And then people that I follow in that community, just kind of seeing who they interact with. It's a really good, good place to get information. 
Yeah, even though sometimes Twitter can become a little bit toxic, and we get yeah. a little bit too hang up on it's it's not personal, even though it's very yeah. personal because everybody shares the stories of their life. It can get so, really bad. Yeah, yeah, especially it's inside. Kind of like say, it's kind of like they say too when you're talking to people, you know, don't talk about religion or politics, and on there everything's you know open game. And fortunately, most of the community is good. There's a few, and even not saying the people that get into the drama are bad people. Sometimes someone has a bad day, says something that they shouldn't. But for the most part, it's 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 pretty good. And there's people that if you get tired of it, you take a break. But I just don't I don't debate with anyone on stuff. You know, it's just as long as you don't get in those debates that escalate into, into arguments. So I just try to be in and just like. I try my darndest because I don't want to upset anyone. So if I go to type it's something, it's impossible. These days, it's impossible. Sure I really think of every kind of scenario this could be looked at wrong and adjust what I'm saying. But <laughs> so, sometimes it's exhausting. Sometimes I say, yeah. if, if you like me, you follow me. If you don't like me, you don't stop following yeah. me. <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> it just can be exhausting to just uh, cut everything through different angles. And Ultimately, we, we all make mistakes. So if somebody gets offended, you say sorry and you move on. Ultimately, that's that. But if uh, I, I go, I go back because this uh, what I love of this podcast is I, I tend to focus on the people and, and the personal stories. So can you tell more about uh, so, some funny stories about pen testing? Yeah, let's see more funny stories about pen testing uh, or, or the best achievement or some some yay yeah. days that you had. Some, some exciting. Yeah, some interesting stories about pen tests. I've done some wireless pen tests for hospitals. And it's kind of interesting some of the stuff you see come up on a Wi-Fi network. Sometimes you see the insulin pumps, different network oh, Jesus. medical devices. <laughs> but that gets kind of scary. I was doing a pen test for a hospital. And when we were talking about pen tests, and we discussed what time do you want to test because we don't cause any outages. And it got the, you know, they had like a single person security department for like 10 hospitals the oh, CISO Jesus. and actually when I was doing the pen test for for the hospital they were looking they were just getting ready to add another resource so the CISO was doing all the work and so when we're discussing the pen test he was kind of worried that you know we might accidentally take down some medical equipment which I had that concern too once I realized you know there's you know different insulin pumps different devices that could cause harm to someone on the network I was really scared was touching stuff. Well, so we had to be really careful. So what we did is we just adjusted the scope to do a, a vulnerability assessment. We looked for the devices and then we did like a config review of the controllers for the access point. So we kind of altered our path, get, got the same, uh, you know, results without causing any, you know, possible problems or outages or, you know, and also help, you know, the, uh, the CISO and the management there feel a little more comfortable with the process. Yeah, no, I think it's carried out. I was actually on, on a similar scope and I, and I was doing an assessment uh, on uh, um, a cancer treatment machine and the controller and the regulator were both on the network. So if we could overcharge the dose and kill people and on medical device, I am terrified because sometimes you don't think, but everything is, is starting to get connected with the network. So it's a yeah. machine that kills human by just a ping. Ping of that now is going to become yeah, something real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was like several, several years ago now, but those insulin pumps that were hack, hackable and, uh, you know, there's insulin pumps and some of the pacemakers, one of the pacemakers, you know, I heard about that was, was hackable. And so, yeah, that's the scary thing about that. And also I did a, a pen test for a company one time that makes medical devices and, you know, just seeing that equipment attached to it, we weren't testing that. That was a, their RD environment. It wasn't like in production, but, you know, just seeing that just kind of scared you realize what's, What's available? And I mean, when I first started doing web app pen, I mean wireless pen test, just you know, doing a war driving of the, this this parking lot of this facility, and seeing people's vehicles show up, you know, seeing someone's Audi, you know. Oh yeah, right. Now cars sitting. are connected as well. As we've yeah. seen, we've seen tons of hands of cars. And manufacturer not used to do security. I mean, even yeah. even cyber, even IT company are not used to do security. So even less. I mean, IoT device is is it just a completely different world. So yeah, scary words. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's pretty. It's just, and as more <laughs> stuff gets connected and you know homes are connected, and so well, hopefully yeah. we're gonna have more purple teams. So on that note, yeah. can you give a very good positive note about cybersecurity for everybody who's out there? Because we're giving them the scare factor in the last yeah, 10, like, ten minutes. <laughs> well, I think that's a two. You know, like I said, mentioned. Everyone wants to be red team or pen tester, but the world needs blue team. I mean, we need the defenders. And if you really, you know, you work in technology, sometimes you may not feel like you're really doing anything, but if you're working in security, you're, you know, helping the world be a safer place, you know, for your customers. And if you work for, you know, like a Facebook or Twitter, then you're make you're helping, you know, people be more secure online. So there's a, a mission to that and, and a lot, you know, so you can just do your part. And then, you know, if you're, also, too, awareness, you know, th there's conferences for technical people, but you can also inform people that are not technical, get out there to some of the different meetup groups that are just, you know. Oh, you're granny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're granny how to use a password yeah. manager. <laughs> you know, go you know, see if the library or something does talks for people and just kind of help, you know, security awareness. I mean, that's one of the things ISC Squared does, too. They offer those courses for continuing education credits to to get out there and teach people about security awareness. And that's the biggest thing. A lot of times people know there's risks, but they don't really understand what the risks how, are. Or how to fix it. And that's yeah. the, the so wide factor. Yeah. I love that. I love I love to leave everybody of the audience with a positive security message. And it's not too many good, but we're getting better. <laughs> and there are tools available and people, amazing people are you really yeah. doing so much for the community. So thank you so much for coming in. We finally made it happen. I really okay. appreciate awesome. everything. And I uh, thank for my heart for all the support that you do for the community, especially for sport. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me as a guest. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider leaving us a review or sponsoring us on Patreon. It helps us bring on amazing guests and keep the podcast alive and free. Consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash CSCP and watch other episodes at www.cybercloudpodcast.com. Thank you.